Hi, Peter Hudson here. Uh, today I want to talk about a combination of mostly open source software that helps an aircraft designer to better imagine what it's like to fly the, the aircraft he's creating. Basically to go from uh, conceptual design to uh, virtual reality simulation of that flying machine. In other words, to go from something like this to something like this. This is not exactly a tutorial. I'm not going to talk about each and every button click. Uh, there's several different software packages, and each with its own really good set of tutorials online. So what I did do, though, was record the process uh, on a, one of my projects and decided to put all the clips together into a, move, into a single video so that if you needed to, you could pause it and look at where I'm clicking and maybe what menu choices I'm making. So in that sense, maybe it's a tutorial, but I don't plan to walk you through each and every uh, step. I like to set up a working directory that's independent of the X-Plane folders. Uh, those are a unique directory structure where you'll eventually put your, your aircraft files uh, that allows X-Plane to identify and, and load up those, those aircraft. Another bit of housekeeping to do before getting down to business is I know I'm going to want to color my aircraft, probably white, uh, at least for, for initial testing purposes. Uh, I'll have a pilot. I want to give him a jumpsuit color and maybe a, a fleshy color for his head. Uh, and I'll need some transparencies for the canopy so I can see out. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and make those ahead of time. I use GIMP. You can probably make these using whatever your favorite software for making images is. Um, one thing that you should note is they should be square images and they should be multiples of two. So I'm going to do 1024 by 1024. I do want to show you making your own airfoil data for X-Plane. It can be kind of important for the simulation you're creating if you want it to have the right type of experience or feel. Uh, and in this case, I'm going to use X-Foil. Actually, it's X-Foil as it exists within uh, XFL05. You could use polars from wind tunnel data. You could use airfoiltools.com. Uh, that's a nice site for it. Um, but at some point you need to get the information for airfoil and then I'll show you how we uh, create an airfoil file that X-Plane can read. Using Airfoil Maker, uh, it's a little bit trial and error. Uh, I find it's helpful to start with an airfoil that has similar properties to what you might be wanting to use. Um, sometimes that's all you really need to do is just select what you want and use that. But if you're going to put your own airfoil data in, starting with something close is a little bit helpful. Uh, there's some parameters on the left hand side of airfoil maker that you can tweak to change lift curve slopes and zero lift angles and what the drag buckets look like and you're trying to match those up to the airfoil data you looked at the polars that you created earlier once I have that airfoil data the way I like it or close enough I'll go ahead and save that in my working directories for this uh, demonstration in fact the first thing I wanted to do with this concept here. It's a ultralight uh, self-launching sailplane uh, with electric motors, uh, folding props. Uh, one of the key characteristics of ultralight gliders is that fairly often the pilot winds up in a, in a position with really poor visibility. You're either under the wing or above the wing. and um, So I'm interested in where the, the pilot position is optimum. I'd like it to be as far back as it can be, and electric motors as far forward, the battery at about the CG, uh, but if the visibility is really poor there, I can move the motors further aft and the batteries further aft and the pilot further forward, uh, and I, I think the having everything close to the middle or, or everything closer to the center of gravity is better from a pitch inertia point of view and yaw inertia point of view, um, but visibility is really important. So I'm going to explore that in this video. My starting position is with the pilot as far aft as I can get him without his head interfering with the, the spar, which in this wing and this airfoil is at about 
And I just gotta throw it out here. If you guys haven't tried OpenPSP, you're really missing out. It's an amazingly easy tool to create concepts and shapes. Um, it gives you analytical capabilities. You can do stability derivatives and you know, span-wise loading. There's all kinds of features and they're all very easy to use. Um, for example, just look at the ease with which it meshes the uh, the airframe into an S into an OBJ file that I can read directly into to Blender. Uh, I just um, overall I'm very impressed with this software. While OpenVSP is a very versatile tool and very easy to use, uh, Blender is also open source. It's an amazing capability, but there's a learning curve with that one. You'll spend some time before you feel comfortable moving around. And then on top of that, you'll need explain to Blender. It's an add-on for Blender that allows us to export things to, like add data refs and export objects for in the explain format. In OpenVSP, you created your, your model in whatever units you decided you wanted to use. Uh, in my case, I was using feet. In Blender, its default units are, are meters, and uh, I'm, so what I have to do is scale this down, because right now instead of a 50-foot span, I've got a 50-meter span. And the other thing with uh, X-Plane is that from Blender to X-Plane, you, you need your aircraft in the right coordinate system. Um, in this case, the Y-axis in Blender becomes the longitudinal axis for the aircraft. I am, however, making a mistake here in that I point it in the wrong direction on the y-axis, but we'll fix that later. So although your part was read in as a single object, the individual components um, are, are not linked together in Blender. So you can select one, um, change, you know, partition it uh, based on the selection, rename it to something else, and break it down into to different pieces so that you can work with them independently. Tilting the pilot's head won't likely be necessary unless you have a, a very supine pilot as I do. But since pilot head position is what I'm looking at, I wanted to get it about as reasonable as I could before uh, cutting off his head. And the reason for cutting off his head is that uh, when you're in virtual reality, you don't want that in the way of your, your ability to see, but you want your eyes to be where his eyes are. Um, so in views from within the cockpit, the head becomes invisible. Uh, but views outside the cockpit, you can see the head because, well, you should. UV mapping is a concept you may be unfamiliar with. Essentially what it's doing is telling, um, explain which triangles should be colored by which parts of the, the PNG files you created earlier. I'm not doing a very careful job here. I'm not specifically unwrapping everything in such a way that it's easy to color pockets and shoes and gloves. I just want his head to be one color and his body the other, so I'm keeping it as simple as I can. So I'll select all the triangles that are his head and move them into the fleshy colored corner of the PNG file, and all of the triangles that are his body and move them into the orange flight suit colored part of the PNG file, uh, but with no real care over which triangles are where on those on those colors. And technically this is a step one could skip and the pilot will just be that same sort of gray color uh, in X-Plane. Cutting off the canopy uh, f for this project is is sort of the whole point. I, I want to see what it looks like from the pilot's point of view when I'm flying. Uh, I want to pick my canopy cut lines that are consistent with what I would plan for the real aircraft. In this case, because the pilot's head is so far aft, its canopy transparency is going to have to go up over the wing and, and back a bit. Explain when it renders only colors one side of the triangles, the side with the outward facing normal. Um, in this case, this would be making the outside of the airplane white, but the inside you wouldn't see at all. It would be transparent. Um, we would like to see the inside of our cockpit, so I'm going to copy the forward section of the fuselage, shrink it down just a little bit, and flip the normals so that Explain has to color those in too. So as I said, the, each 
collection will be exported as an object. Uh, there's a special thing about glasses that need to be uh, rendered after the other objects are rendered so that you can see through and see objects inside the cockpit from outside. And um, We're going to have an exterior glass collection and an interior glass collection. And we need the interior glass collection uh, to be rendered last, and we'll do that by the order in which we import them into Plane Maker. Um, but for right now, let's just point at the fact that we need a, a collection called glass that doesn't have to be called glass, but a collection that I'll call glass, and that'll be the canopy as seen from the outside and then a shrunken down version of that canopy with the normals flipped that'll be the interior glass. In this case both glass objects will end up using the same glass.png file. That's not a problem. So in the long run each collection we have over in the upper right hand corner will be exported as an object. Within those collections you can have multiple different mesh objects like the pilot and head can both be in the pilot collection. Um, the materials for each one of those objects needs to be assigned. And so I assign, for example, airframe material to each component in the airframe, which right now is a fuselage and then another everything else sort of object. Um, so we can assign the material in Blender, and then when we UV map we have to tell it again which uh, PNG file we want it to be. And then on top of that, in, when we're exporting collections, we need to tell the collection which PNG file. So you, you sort of need to identify that PNG file in three different places. On this particular plane, the part of the wing leading edge that's inside the cockpit should be removed back to the 40% spar. Don't want that interfering with the pilot's view. About the only thing you don't already know about your aircraft's configuration is exactly where the pilot's eyes are, and since you need to put those into X-Plane as your pilot viewpoint, I find it's easiest just to measure it here in Blender. Um, of course, then convert it from meters to feet for, for Plane Maker. And now, uh, one of the major steps we've all been waiting for is exporting what we've done in Blender into objects for X-Plane. I like to go through and make sure they all have the right PNG files associated with the collection. Each collection is identified as root so that it exports. And then we're ready to go. Just export OBJ and, and it's done. And they should be in the same directory as your blend file wherever you saved that. So at about the halfway point here, I'm copying files to the explain folder structure. Um, I like to put my object files in, a, in an object folder within the aircraft folder. Um, now is probably a good time to go get another cup of coffee if you're watching this blow by blow, because um, we still got another 10 minutes or so to go, and another 25 steps. We need to edit a couple of things in the glass the exterior and the interior glass objects uh, basically just add a couple lines to make sure they're rendered properly and then delete a line at the bottom of the file. There may be a way to set this up in Blender with uh, explain to Blender. Uh, I'm not really an expert, I just kind of grind my way through it until it gets what I want. So for now it's easier for me just to go in and edit them by hand. Obviously, X-Plane is not open source uh, freeware <coughs> as a tool, but um, they do provide things like Plane Maker and Airfoil Maker as utilities. Once you own the software, you also own all the tools you need to, to create aircraft for it. You know, right now, I'm just using a working title for this ultralight motor glider, 125 square foot wing. Um, naming your plane something cool is one of the benefits of, of doing your own design naming it for some bird of prey or mythological creature or, or your kids or your cat. Um, you know, that's, I'll save that for when I've got the, the configuration a little more refined. Well, remember I told you I, I put the aircraft on the wrong axis. So I am going to go back into Blender, rotate it around and put it in the other direction on the y-axis and then re-export my, my, my object files. And I can tell that because the big cylindrical 
initial fuselage in plane maker uh, starts with this nose at zero and goes in the right direction and my plane starts with this nose at zero and goes in the wrong direction. Making fuselages in plane maker is one of the more tedious uh, tasks it, but it is important the the shape of this fuselage is what it's going to use to approximate the mass moments of inertia and surface area and drag so it's part of the the, the flight model so it should be close but it doesn't have to be perfect In Plane Maker, we go to miscellaneous objects, and that's where we can add the, our pilot and our glass and any other objects you might have created in Blender. Um, th and as I mentioned before, having the glass object, sec the exterior glass object second to last, and then the interior glass object last uh, is, is important. You can also adjust the location of the objects. I'm not doing that in this case. I have them all uh, based on the the zero origin that I had in Blender. Um, but if I wanted to slide the pilot back or forth, the actual pilot object back or forth, I could do it in this section here and just move that one object, move that one object's longitudinal position. But I'd still have to go change the viewpoint um, for the, the pilot's eyes. You also need to let Plane Maker know wh whether these objects are inside or outside, what sort of lighting you want them to have. Uh, and the glass objects should be um, identified as glass outside and glass inside. In this case I don't have a cockpit object defined, um, not by the definition of, of what X-Plane is expecting, but I do like to go through and set that all of the objects are visible both in external views and in the 3D cockpit view. The steps I'm walking through in Plane Maker are all needed for the aircraft to fly. You need to set VNE, you need to do your weight and balance, um, you need to create the wings and fuselages and things that it, it's going that X-Plane is going to use to calculate the forces on the aircraft. So the objects that we created are what we're going to see, but what we're creating in X-Plane is, what is, is what's being used for the math. And in the end we hide all the, the math pieces and just let the the visual objects that we created in Blender um, do the job. So when you're playing with configurations uh, whilst flying in, in X-Plane, you can come back in here and change the wing parameters like dihedral or chord percentage of flying surfaces, things you might uh, want to be experimenting with in flight. It won't change what things look like in X-Plane, uh, but it'll change how it behaves. And then later, if you settle in on a different set of dihedral than you started with, you can you know, create a new object for that piece. Things like dihedral are, are obviously a variable you want to play with when you have a high aspect ratio wing like this. The adverse yaw and yaw roll coupling uh, are an important thing to balance. Uh, long high aspect ratio wings like this um, have a lot of adverse yaw and dihedral couples that with roll so that the adverse yaw is tending to resist the roll you were trying to create when you when you gave it stick input. You can balance that with rudder, but it's something you have to fight a little bit. The amount of dihedral you have then helps define how much rudder input you need and maybe how much rudder authority you need. Um, but the other side of that coin is that if you're in a 45 degree bank circle and you decided not to use dihedral to reduce that yaw roll coupling, well, now you'll be in more of an overbanking problem where you're having to use a lot of top stick to keep that uh, turn at that bank angle. So there's a balance in there, and, and it's not hard to play with that in, in X-Plane. You can be flying along and then pause and go out and change your dihedral and then reload the aircraft and art and come back in and fly it some more and see how you like it. And I, and I think that's what I'm getting at with this whole process is that you can use it as a design tool in a way that's maybe a little more intuitive than looking at stability of derivatives and plotting out frequencies of cycles.
All right, we're just about ready to have a look at everything in X-Plane. If we've put our folders in the correct location, then when we first start up X-Plane, we should be able to find the name of our aircraft, but there won't be a picture of it. We'll need to generate those icons. So if you find an aircraft with the name um, that you gave it, uh, there'll be a question mark for what it looks like. We'll go ahead and start up with that and then go in uh, and generate icons. All right, we're getting close. Um, we've got icons generated. I've walked around the aircraft. It looks pretty good. You, you can see the test pilot in the cockpit with his bright orange flight suit. But for this particular uh, experiment, I really need to fly this in VR. Uh, manipulating the views uh, with a you know, mouse pad or what have you is it's just not the same as being able to look around and move your head around and see what it would really be like to fly it with the obstructed view you think you might have. There are other things about flying with VR that are also important. You know, to me, the, the part where you're looking back over your shoulder at where you intend to land while you're flying straight ahead, um, the how much your neck is twisted and pointed downward and everything, that's all information your brain uses to adjust your flight path. Um, and yeah, I just can't get that um, without flying it in virtual reality. All right, here we are in the cockpit, ready to roll down 3-3 at Inukern. Um You can see the reflections of my bright orange uh, flight suit, and, you know, in retrospect, maybe a nice dull gray suit would have been better, and maybe not so white an interior cockpit. A lot of those reflections in the canopy um, are, are kind of distracting, uh, both in real life and in, in virtual reality. It looks like I probably could have used a little more transparency, too. Things seem to be a little bit more obscured than I'd like. So this particular flight, my goal is to take a really short tow, do a, a, an abbreviated pattern, and see how my visibility is um, whilst trying to hit a, you know, land at a spot on the ground. Um, and if I have enough energy left over, I might go ahead and switch the cockpit view to a little bit further forward and, and fly another pattern and see how that feels. So the view over the top of the wing and in a steeper bank isn't really too bad. I don't mind that at all. It would have been nice to get a better look at that windsock. There's a lot of fine details, fit and finish, on on this model that are obviously uh, pretty poor. You can see the through the wing, and there's a lot of gaps. You can also see that tablet that X-Plane likes to give you in VR. Um, there's an easy way to make that go away. I just haven't bothered to do that yet. Now, I haven't animated any control surfaces or any interior cockpit flight controls. A lot of that's work that's best saved for later as well. Yeah, here's the part of the visibility from this position I don't like. Once I fly by my intended uh, target for landing, uh, the wing obstructs the view. Uh, it's really difficult to get a look at it, keep it in my view so that I can more accurately adjust my flight path. And you can't really tell here, but I'm, I'm moving along pretty fast. and. For an ultralight sailplane, this is enough altitude I think I can go around again. So I'm going to go ahead and adjust the pilot's view position forward by about a foot and see how it looks. Um, it'll be a little bit shorter pattern, but I think I can make it all the way back around. Basically, I can just pause the simulation, go into Plane Maker, make the adjustment, save it, go back into to virtual reality, and reload the aircraft in art, um, and it'll make the updates to it and then I can unpause and continue the flight with a new position. The ability to do that so quickly while you're flying, um, to me that's an amazing tool. Right? That gives you a lot of freedom in playing with design variables and a very quick turnaround, um, oh, that's what that change meant to me, or How's, here's how it feels different from what I had before. So you can see I moved my pilot viewpoint forward a foot. I didn't move the whole pilot forward a foot. If I look aft, you can see the um, decapitated pilots a little bit behind where I'm looking from. All right, I can much more easily keep an eye on my, my aim point. Well, that was just one moment of, of checking it. I, I like it better, of course, but the, the trick is how far back can I go before I feel like I'm being inconvenienced? Um, and I think I'm going to go do a whole bunch more flying to figure that out. Um, 
thanks for watching. And uh, you know, I hope this video inspires you to get familiar with some of these open source tools that are available. <clears throat> they have a positive effect on your conceptual designs, and and it's really just a lot of fun to go make changes and jump back into the cockpit and see how they feel. Um, and I'm interested in how that influences how my design comes out. Next up for me is to add the power plants, a um, couple of electric motors and some batteries, uh, and then you know ditch the tow plane. Um, if your project isn't a glider, you'll have to do that first time around. And like I say, there, there are lots of tutorial sites out there for, for Plane Maker and for Blender and for OpenVSP. Um, there's a lot of learning involved, but once you've got them, the basics figured out, you can really take advantage of these tools. Well, again, this is Peter Hudson. Thanks for watching. Signing off.